chord to the clock. So it has been many months and we have returned for the OODA loop finale. I couldn't think of a clever word name to call this, but I wanted to bring everybody together, all the people who have participated variously in the last sessions. Um, Captain Ramunson, uh, Ras Munson will join us, I hope, shortly. Um, as I was saying before I started recording, we have Professor Turner joining us, the uh, chief author and co-author of the Flow System book, along with myself and Brian Rivera Ponch, who's our ever OODA loop fanatic and expert. Um, also joining us is Charlie Protzman, who's worked with me a lot in the past on lean thinking. He's been doing a lot of research into the OODA loop and uh, has written or drafted some papers, and he may add some thoughts to cause a shallow dive into chaos in this conversation today. Um, and then, of course, we've got our favourite collection of, uh, of uh, experts, uh, Chris Bramley over in the UK, along with Ben Ford, um, and of course, Lou in Chicago, Lou Hayes, a captain over there in Chicago, uh, in the police force. And then we've got our friends in Australia, Andrew Blame, Blaine, I call you Blame. Maybe that's the right word for you, but <laughs> Andrew Blaine, Blaney, who's uh, our resident expert on remote working nowadays, and uh, his partner in crime and, and colleague Kim Ballastrin over in uh, Australia, who will add balance to our nonsense and our ramblings. So over the last few months, we still took a break while we all got busy, as Ponch leaves, um, but we took a break, uh, but we spent about six hours having lots of conversations that went into all sorts of timey-wimey, sort of squiggly-wiggly, sort of all sorts of other metaphors about the OODA loop. And a lot of this was sort of started by some illustrations which Ponch put into the flow system book that had ar ar arisen or arose in a uh, sort of a, a get together that David led in Quantico when they'd sort of looked at complexity, Kenevin, the OODA loop, and then Lou and others had sort of drawn some pictures. And we ended up illustrating where we thought the, uh, where the OODA loop fitted in the different domains of Kenevin. I have those pictures, we might show them in a little while. Uh, and so some of the, our discussions sort of, uh, sort of came off of that uh, those illustrations in the book and that led to six hours of debate discussion and interesting conversation about what the OODA loop is and what it is not and I think what we want to try and get to today is a final explanation of how we think the OODA loop maps to Kenevin or maybe it's the other way around who knows uh, what its utility and complexity thinking and theory is and, and where if anywhere it fits in sort of team science and distributed leadership sort of conversations so I'm going to kick this off by asking what we've surmised so far. Um, I'm going to show you a slide. I'm not going to play many slides here, but I'm going to use some slides just to facilitate the discussion. Um, and one of my initial discussions, uh, my initial uh, slides I made on this, and uh, let me just share the screen. And so this was a slide that I put together uh, some time ago, and I used it when everybody was drawing the OODA loop as a loop. Um, and uh, so I decided to illustrate this and to sort of say, well, okay, it was originally drawn as a loop, but then Boyd redrew the drawing. This is the drawing that came out in the, the, the work he'd done. And I sort of said at the time that uh, OODA is not a loop. Uh, it's explaining how we do what you do, it's not telling you how to do what you do. So it's explaining how we make decisions and think about things. It's implicit guidance control. And I use the phrase, don't PDCA my OODA. So I didn't want people seeing the OODA loop as a PDCA cycle where they could just go around this loop and things would improve. So it was explaining how we thought. Um, and then based upon some conversations I had with Charlie, I took the original drawing of the OODA loop and I did something which none of you have seen before now, which may aggravate and annoy you all, but it will certainly cause some conversation, which is this. So it seems to me that observe is sensing. Dare I even call it sense making, but uh, maybe I'll throw that in for conversation. And then orient 
is basically is your brain. And I credit Charlie with this because this is where he came out in the conversations I was having with him. So orient is your brain in the OODA loop. It's you. That's the orient. And observe is you making sense of everything, sense making, which are all inputs to the orient now. And then when we get to deciding, which, you know, in the original drawing, it talks about decision, making a hypothesis for your decision. This is where you get deduction, induction and abduction, the different forms of reasoning, which in decide, help you inform the, the decision you're going to make. And then the action, of course, is carrying that out. So that was a little bit of the, the, the stuff. I'm going to stop sharing that now. That was a little bit of what sort of entered my mind when we were coming into this. So I'm going to throw this for open discussion. And the question is, what have we surmised so, surmised so far about the OODA loop? Um, and do we agree with some of the propositions I've made there or not? Who wants to try hey, that? Nigel's, so Nigel, uh, just a couple. Um, so this isn't new, um, what you just shared. Good. Uh, there's a couple of things I don't really agree with, but the uh, you remember Boyd actually called it the, the SODA loop, the SODA, sense observe, excuse me, sense orient to side act. Uh, but he changed it to OODA loop uh, um, because it didn't pass the, the laughter test or whatever. So that's true. Uh, orientation uh, and then the sensing or the sensory signals we get from our senses, which could include introspective skills, mm -hmm. uh, I agree with, uh, no doubt there. Uh, I really haven't uh, followed the abductive and inductive thinking there, but uh, for the most part, nothing that you just shared with us is new to me. Good. Well, that was the, I mean, and I do, and of course, the inspiration came from the fact that uh, Boyd had called it the soda loop, SODA, and I appreciate the giggle test there that, that it sort of failed. The, the inductive, deductive, and uh, abductive reasoning, that was uh, something I, I joined uh, Dave with the new Kenevan company, the rebranding of uh, the Kenevan Center, et cetera, to the Kenevan company. I joined a, uh, a webinar he was doing yesterday with uh, uh, Nora Bateson, and uh, that was a really good discussion of which abductive reasoning and abduction sort of came in there. I'll throw another thought out I'd been having is that, and this will really set the cat among the pigeons, I'm sure, is that all, all reasoning, I believe, starts with observation. I think, um, <laughs> so either Dave's praying for forgiveness or accepting I might be right, but I don't know, we'll find out in a minute. Um, so, and that sort of makes sense because we talk about intuition, we talk about uh, acting without any input signals, but for us to act, the brain has to make a decision. It has to, there has to be some form. I see now, I'm going to stop talking now. Dave's shaking his head. Now, oh, everybody, so great. I've now, over to the audience, over to the gang and welcome to Ron, who's just joined. So over to everybody else. Go on, Dave, you look like you want to say something. Well, I was going to let somebody else take it apart first, all right? I think, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, those, those aren't the only two representatives of OODA. Uh, the one and I and others use a lot is the double circle, yeah, which is the principle that if you go around that the process faster than other people, you have strategic advantage. And I think that's an easier way of getting people into things, all right? I think it's also less linear than the way Boyd then drew it, yeah? And I think part of the problem is that the determination of how you make a decision, or rather, you have to decide what type of system you're in before you actually decide what you're going to look for. So you, you can't say that you do observation, then you feed it into a linear process, because actually the type of things you look for depends on the type of system you're in in the first place. And it also depends on time. So in Kinevin terms, if you've got time to shift things into the apparatus, that's more resilient. If you haven't got time to do that, you've got to treat it as if it was complex. So that you know, so, so timeliness is a factor, right? And then that idea that the brain makes all the decisions is just, to be honest, Nigel, it's just fundamentally wrong. Most of the decisions are made by the body or your social interactions. The brain is often an afterthought on that. And, and that sort of enlightenment concept of rationality is just bad, bad science, right? So one of the issues is if your body is making a set of intuitive decisions, and boy, got this completely, right? 
then if those are the wrong decisions, if you've been habituated the wrong way, how do you disrupt that process so you don't just follow through on the cycle? Yeah. So that, that, would, that would be contribution number one, all right? <laughs> you say this is why I facilitate, because I learn. But here's, so let me, let me ask for some yeah. clarification on that for the mere mortals like me and watching this is if we take away the brain, we remove the brain from the head, how does the bucket, well, you see what I'm saying? All right. I mean, this is, this is embodied, embedded, enacted, enabled, all right? Okay, so yeah. basically, and this is, I mean, the left-right brain nonsense is complete nonsense, all right? But there is a difference. And what actually happens is your body reacts without thinking, and then your brain responds to what your body did to check if it got it right this time or not. And that, that's where people like um, Dawkins get free will completely wrong because they're taking a Cartesian model of the brain. They're, they're saying, like Nigel Thurlow said, that everything has to start with a brain, and that's Cartesian, yeah? which is a deadly insult in any intelligent circle, right? If you didn't realise it, I wanted to make that clear. Secondly, if you look at Andy Clark's work, he's and this is the way we're coming on, on the whole concept of assemblage, is the social interactions and the, and the narrative constructs of your social interactions also operate in the same way as your body in that they start to filter what you see and how you respond. And all of these things have evolved for very sensible reasons. They've evolved for reduction of energy consumption. And so the two big things that the OODA loop does not take account of are time and energy. It assumes that those are, are free, right? If you bring time and energy in, then you need to rethink it. Yeah, so I, I would actually, as I said to you, I would put Kinevin as a, as a disc across the OODA line. And then I would use it to compress the OODA line, literally to remove the linear four steps and move it into, depending on which domain you're in, you may or may not go through four steps. In some cases, you may go through one step. So if the situation requires abductive thinking, uh, abduction is achieved through entanglement of different perspectives. It is, it's not a cognitive process in, in, in a primary sense. So just let me just share this for the benefit of the people who watch this back. Oh, my screen does work properly. There we go. Um, that was the drawing that was published in the book. And I can, I got the individual images that show those, that decomposition or those sex, those elements of the, the OODA loop and where they fit. Has your thinking changed yeah. or evolved from this stage? Yeah, and I think if you go back to the Quantico session, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and just remember the Quantico session, and though I didn't realise it at the time, is my left hemisphere of my brain was 70% compressed. So I wasn't on best form anyway, right? But where we came to on Quantico is that Kinevin was primarily about the orientation stage. Okay. Yeah? And that's where it fitted, right? And now, and that's why I'm starting with this concept of Kinevin as a disc, which goes across the OODA loop. And then the OODA loop will actually perform different passages, passageways through Kinevin, dependent on how you start. I just haven't managed to draw this yet. I probably need Sue or somebody to do it for me. And that's where the time dependency, if you've got the time dependency, you move into apparatic. Because apparatic allows you to actually make multiple moves, what we call the apparatic turn in the U field guide. If you haven't got time, you've got to default to complex. Yeah, if you default to complex, you default to abductive. So you default to multiple perspectives because you can't afford to have a single perspective. At no point should ever an individual human brain be making a decision. Yeah, yeah. unless it's something which is very clear. And I mean, this is the issue we got on the other podcast you're on, your idea that complexity arrives from humans. Actually, it doesn't necessarily. Humans are just one factor in a complex axis. Let me just bring, I'm just bringing, uh, uh, we got an image donated. I'm just making sure I'm pulling that up. So Chris sent us an image. I'll bring that up in a, in a few seconds and we can look at that. Um, so let's I, have a, just get, I have a question. I have a question for Dave. Yeah. Can, can, you, can you go back to the energy piece and kind of walk us through what you, why you think it's missing from the OODA loop? Okay, so this is the key thing that we get from constructor theory. Yeah? And what I'm currently building in what's called the Estuarine framework for the moment. 
It's going to have a Welsh name because there are five different well, we have 15 different words for estuary in Welsh, I've discovered. And at least two thirds of them are pronounceable by the English. So I'm going to pick one of them after I've had the discussion. Um, but the estuary model constructor theory is one feed to that, but it's not the only feed that's important to realize. Yeah. So what constructor theory does, and I think this transforms Ulu loop, by the way, you start by mounting ma mapping counterfactual. So you map what isn't possible. Okay? Now, the variation I've introduced into that is you also have to manage the energy and the time frame for whether it's impossible or not. Okay? So if the energy cost of change is too high or the time for change is too high, then it's a definitive counterfactual. Now, what that does is that limits the range of things you've got to scan. So if you've got the right counterfactual map of where you are, life gets a lot easier. If you then understand what the constructors are in the system, and then you can create constructors, so constructors are safe to fail experiments. And the key insight I had is when we do constraint mapping, you know, is constraints which contain a counterfactuals, constraints which connect to constructors. So that makes life a lot easier, yeah? And we don't have to abandon constraint mapping. You know? But then the key thing which then comes out, and this is in, in, in David's work, is he says, whatever has the lowest energy gradient is going to happen. All right, now, that's actually quite exciting because it gives us a predictive capacity in, an, in complexity. If we correctly map the counterfactuals and the constructors and we map the energy gradient, we've got the ability to tell people what's likely to happen. Yeah. All right. So that sort of changes it right and i say energy and time are the missing components of what boyd did yeah and the situations in which he's working on assume a constant energy gradient and he does sort of get into the time difference but he's generally assuming very little actual time to make a decision yeah and that, that's the context of where he came from in warfare now in actual fact in other human systems and this is where uda is currently written breaks down, you might actually have considerable time and you might be able to spend a lot more time in situational assessment than otherwise you would have to have to do. Whereas in other cases, you might have to go directly in. So that's why I'm starting to see Kinevin or Estherine as, as an initial framing with then multiple different types of OODA loops which thread through the things in different ways. Yeah, Assuming it's still got value in that context. I think when we think back to some of the previous conversations, Lou, you had had a lot when we started to talk about the time aspect was one of the things we did talk about quite a bit in previous conversations. <clears throat> and we also talked about the speed of the OODA loop because everybody thought the OODA loop was this sort of rapid thing. And in certain circumstances, it isn't necessarily that fast. It isn't, I mean, in Ponchi's world back in the day, and even in Ben's world, of course, and I'll come to you in a second, Ben, Ponch was in an environment where it was had to be lightning fast, thinking, reacting, deciding, because his life depended on it. But it, and indeed, certainly in the police, uh, in the police forces, you have that situation again where rapid thinking, rapid acting is, is absolutely critical and crucial. But in other circumstances, you're still going through that same process. But the time horizon is completely different. Um, before I bring Ben in, Dave, is that is that part part yeah, of? Yeah, I just add something else, and I'm playing with this at the moment. So I've just I've just hiked out all of Merker's books from you know Prussian military history. But I need to reread what he said because he's more insightful than people realise. Yeah, and I think one of the things we're starting to look at is can you change the counterfactual universe for your competitor or for your enemy? So does management of counterfactuals become a strategic input in terms of the landscape of decision making? And again, that shift in Uda away from the concept of a, a fairly fast cycle decision process into something where you're also changing the landscape within which people make decisions. Yeah, so if your counterfact, if you have more available to you than your competition, yeah, then your energy gradient of innovation is low. Whereas if the competition has a limited area, their energy cost of innovation is high. And that would apply in warfare as well, I think, for you know, the military people, yeah? Is if you, and I think that's what we're missing, it's time and energy as a key component on this. 
Ben, you wanted, you had your hand up a minute ago. What did you want to add? Then we'll go to John since he's put his hand up. Ben. Yeah, okay. So just reasoning about, so I wanted to pick up on the energy point. Um, so obviously one of one of the things that Boyd did before he came out with the loop was, um, was energy manoeuvre theory, which is very, very strongly based in, you know, second law of thermodynamics was a really key input into that. So I think... I think I think there's something to explore here because I, I think there's a lot more to Boyd's understanding of time and energy than perhaps the superficial OODA loop would lead you to first belief. Um, and I and I think so. There's a bit of loose nested slinkies here, right? So if if you're in a position where you do have time, it doesn't mean that you stay there because if your opponent is able to change your landscape essentially by yeah, you know, I think um, the idea of shaping counterfactuals as a means of shaping other the other party's cognition is is a really really important thing to dig into here. But I think the same thing could happen with time. You know, you might, you might think you've got a load of time, and then you know somebody pulls a fast transient on you, and all of a sudden, all of that time that you've wasted well, not wasted, but all that time that you've spent on making a decision is now energy that is gone like you've, you've used a bunch of energy and a bunch of time making a decision that somebody has now taken away from you by changing the landscape so there's you know now we're into that kind of you know very kind of co-recursive multiple different time frames going on um but I, yeah i think i think the whole kind of constructor theory and counterfactuals and bringing in time and energy into the loop is is going to be very interesting Probably, probably something more than we've got another hour and a half for though. <laughs> let's let's pull John in. John, you had your hand up if you want to unmute. And uh, so, John, you're a real professor, so I'm hoping for words of wisdom that uh, oh. help me out with Dave since he just told me I was an idiot. The implications are that the rest of us aren't, all right? <laughs> I didn't say. Trying to find some some safety in numbers here. This is from somebody who's never even made the status. <laughs> but, so I just want to pick up. So time and energy are two of the areas that the OODA loop is lacking. Um, some of the potential problems from the literature identify information overload, and that gets into what, what we looked at, um, what we call its logical depth. So the harder it is to access the original source of the information, the more energy is required to access that energy. So that's, that's an issue. So if you have a high logical depth to access the information, then it takes longer to get around the loop, right? <clears throat> so that, that's an issue. Um, and then the time, cognitive load, information overload. So then you're looking at reaching a person's maximum capacity, which leads into where the social component comes into play. And even though, Boyd probably addressed it, then these items aren't necessarily shown in the model. So that that's kind of goes into where some of the confusion is with the model. And it leads to the larger issue, and this is another potential problem with the OODA loop, is the validity of the model. So it's there's a lot of written works from, from Boyd and others in there, but the model really hasn't been tested in the literature, not empirically. And so the model hasn't really been validated <clears throat> so from a, from a researcher's point of view it's hard to get footing when you're talking about the OODA loop when it's a model that's not validated so we really need to and part of my interest in this is not just the OODA loop but it's looking at a lot of other uh, decision making models from neuroscience cognitive science and others and sense making and taking the current knowledge from all these models and kind of compile them into an integrated model on decision making. And so that's where my interest lies. <clears throat> but um, there's an interesting link here as well, which I've been trying to find stuff and I haven't found stuff, which is bringing in with Ashby. So mm -hmm. the big piece of work we did with Ashby when I was working for Poindexter at DARPA was we needed to revert, we needed to break Ashby's law. Because as long as Ashby's law applies, the energy cost of 
government response to asymmetric warfare is makes means you always lose. Yeah. And that was when we started to get into human sensor networks. So you you so and for example, the work we did in Afghanistan with company commanders acting as field agents in real-time sensor networks, that's a much lower energy cost than patrol reports and synthesis of patrol reports. So we moved into real-time distributed human sensor networks. And that was the argument we made at the government level, which we've, I think we're almost close to presented to Biden that finally, which is every school child at 16 in the whole of America is a sensor. Yeah? Because what you've then done is you've radically reduced the energy costs in the center by distributing to multiple human sensors yeah, in the system as a whole. Now, once you do that, again, OODA changes. And I think that, that the OODA-ASHBY overlap, and I've yet to see anybody really compare OODA with ASHBY in the literature, um, which is odd, really, because of the sort of systems thinking dependency on ASHBY, right? And the way they adopted OODA. But I haven't seen anything. But John, you might have something. I haven't seen hardly anything on ASHBY with the OODA. In the, in the literature I've, so far. I've searched and searched. I, I, I was really surprised me. I thought there's bound to be some papers on this. Yeah. And then there's, a, there's an obvious link. Yeah. And the, the neuroscience literature that I've been finding, they're, they're really heavy. They focus a lot of the testing on Simon's decision making model. Yeah. And that, that's where I think you need to go to Clark, not neuroscience. Okay. Yeah. All right, although Anhill, I think, is different on that. So you need to go into the, the six E's group on, on neuroscience decision making. Okay. And that also, by the way, the other key literature there is the new materialist literature, which isn't just the feminist side of that, it's also Delanda. Right? So the new materialist literature relates very strongly. Yeah. And because Simon was a precursor to, to Boyd, I don't know if there was a lot of influence from Simon on on board. I don't know if you've seen that, child. child think Simon, Simon influenced a lot of people, I think, all right, yeah. without any question, right? But I think I, I would place Simon and to a degree Boyd firmly in that enlightenment tradition of rational decision making. Right. right. And that is the one which has been substantially challenged by new materialism, by what we discover in the evolutionary psychology. So the and also the uh, the fascinating stuff on the level of political awareness in so-called primitive humans, which is challenging the whole Rousseau, Rousseau concept, right? Yeah. And it actually now turns out from the archeology span that humans went between different political forms based on the season of the year, yeah? Mm -hmm. So they had an ability to disperse and, and recreate. So I think anything which comes out of that enlightenment tradition is now suspect, to be honest. Okay. And then so, the other direction is that they're shifting to a network based model in multi agent systems because it requires multi agents. And so I think one of the things we should, should do, or what I'd like to do, is take the OODA loop and move it into a more multi agent to be to yeah, a higher second order level. Provided you make that biological and epigenetic, all right? Because the trouble is most of the cognitive neuroscientists are still focused on a computer model of the brain. So they're building networks and nodes right. yeah, based on binary processes. Whereas actually we know the human brain is, is analog, not binary, all right? And, and that has significance. So again, I think that's where the sort of new materialism, new realism is, is coming through big time, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go to, to Ben in just a second because I'm making some notes here, which I'll loop back to, no pun intended, in uh, some of the other points that I wrote down to for us to probably discuss. And I know that Charlie's done extensive research on a lot of Boyd's notes. And, and I know that Ponch was writing in the chat, which, of course, nobody else will see but ourselves, that Ashby's work is found in Boyd's finding guide so we'll probably uh, talk about that and see Charlie nodding so but before we go down that route uh, Ben what do you want to add to this discussion between John and John and Dave because the rest of us were just writing notes extensively you included I think yeah I, I just wanted to ask a question about that assertion that the energy required in a 
distributed human sensor network is is less. Um, if if you've got lots and lots of sensing happening at the edges of a system, in order to turn that into, I don't know, I don't know what the word for it would be. I don't want to say insight or or something like that, but to turn it into a different form of information, you have to process those signals that are coming in. So, do they do those kind of things not sort of average out? You know, you've either got uh, a they, small they, number of patrol reports from it. That, that, that's on, where I went. I mean, because one of the things Poindexter, Poindexter set me several challenges, all right, which were fascinating. One of them was to solve the problem of objectification of abduction. Yeah? And that's where we got into human sensor networks. Now, I mean, the way to illustrate this is I have an app which I keep my expenses up to date on. So if every time I incur an expense, I put it into the app, the energy cost is minuscule. If I just put all the receipts into a box and then have to put them all together, the energy cost is high. So there is a distributed incidental approach to energy, which doesn't consume time. So what we found, for example, with company commanders is observations in the field under fire in a very simple form was a lot easier for them than writing the report. So it does seem that real time data is less energy consumptive than retrospective data. And I think one of the reasons for that is retrospective data is always justification. Okay, it's, it's the point we're making about yeah, that comes that. From a whole body of research, which says the way we know things when we make decisions is different from the way we know things when we describe how we made a decision later. Yeah. So I think that that's the, that's the way you reduce the energy gradient, right? Or you're borrowing energy from another source. And remember, I know this is controversial, but it's not my fault. Other people are wrong. Um, complex human systems are not subject to the second law of thermodynamics, right? And that's really that really important to understand. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Um, Kim, you just, have just your hand one, Just one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ben. Can I? Can I just come back one, one, one little thing on that? Um, that idea of real-time updates being less energy um, demanding. Is that not because we're actually increasing the cadence with which we're updating our orientation to a degree? No, so it's we, we're actually, processing it, one thing at a time. It's because there's a huge redundancy in human sense making anyway. So if you put small things into that redundancy, then it doesn't impact on the overall energy need. Whereas if you make it a specific yeah. task, you hugely increase the energy energy needs. Right. And so, so that's why yeah. doing small things continuously is better than doing things on a puncture. Now, for a computer, it's the other way around. This is one of the big differences between computational intelligence and human intelligence. So, so for computational intelligence, batching makes sense. For human beings, it doesn't make sense because we think abductively. Yeah. And we think in abstractions. This is something I want to come back to because this whole thing about how we derive, how we do thinking and how we derive hypotheses is something I really want to come back to, especially some of the things I heard in your session yesterday, Dave, uh, when you were talking with Norma. That was Norma, fun. So. That was, you had 1,500 people on that. Yeah, it was really, really good. And I've seen some of the comments online similarly, but I want to whiz all the way over to Australia and bring Kim in, who's been patiently waiting. Kim, save us from some of this because my head's already hurting. I'm going, I'm going to bring in a thing that, so my brain went to a different spot when Dave was talking about the human sensor networks uh, and the energy. I'm thinking about something slightly different uh, and I'll use an analogy and I'm checking my understanding. Uh, so I've been learning how to spin fibre into yarn, which is fascinating and fun. And um, one of the things early on is when you're um, drafting the fibre, and the wheel spinning and putting twist into it, your fingertips are learning how to feel how much twist is going into the thread. And if you let too much twist go in and you let it go too far, it's really mm. hard. Right? And I'm now at the stage where, you know, I can do it very easily. So the way, I, the way I'm thinking, this is a parallel to the human sensor networks and it's a different thing is... I'm not 
calculating all of the different things I'm feeling in my fingertips and mm-hmm. saying, oh, this little sensor in my fingertip is telling me blah, 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 and this one's telling me this other thing and how do I make sense of that, right? It's the combination of all of those small little impulses that I'm getting that is helping me to learn how much twist to put in the fibre. And I'm thinking the human sensor networks give us a different thing, which is, we will learn that sort of thing. We will see things like how much twist is in the fibre, the equivalent from all of these little bits of sensing happening in our human sensor networks. The really interesting thing on that is your brain and your body are physically altering as you acquire the skill, right? And that's what human beings can do, which computers can't. So it's like the hypercampus of London taxi drivers. So what experience does is it reduces the energy cost of doing repetitious tasks. Now, if you take Andy Clark's work on social knowledge and the whole concept of scaffolding, then by creating a human sensor network with people with a common discipline, yet what you're actually doing is you're building into the social process a low energy cost response mechanism as people become familiar with it. And, and that that that's really important because it's 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 uh, uh, I've got a big debate coming with somebody in IBM on AI who I thought I was going to have a debate with, but we ended up in the Russian clash of agreement, which I'm still recovering from. Right, but one of the things we're looking at is what are the human aspects of artificial intelligence. So she's actually bringing me in on a program on that at the moment, and part of it is the human ability to use biology for data interpretation. Yeah, if I feel that like if you look at um, Eva's work, I mean, she actually argues symbolic language. Which she now knows the mechanism by which symbolic language is inherited, yeah, you know, physically through RNA. So what we're seeing from epi- epigenetics is an ability through social process and interaction to pass on capabilities through RNA, not DNA. And again, that's reduction of energy cost. Yeah. So I know John had his hand up, but I'm just reading some of the things in the the chat box, which of course people watching the video back later won't be able to see. But you know, Chris, you're sort of musing whether this is collective implicit guidance and control. And of course, we've had this conversation about in what's implicit, what's explicit, and this notion of can can anything other than an in, individual have implicit guidance and control? I'm just throwing these out as some comments we can muse on. Of course, everybody um, is sort of giving. Kim, a big thing, thumbs up for saying what she did. And that also makes me think again when I come back to, and we're going to move on to this in a few minutes when we start looking at the Orient box, if you like, or the Orient element of the OODA loop. It seems to be the, the focal point. And even Dave's earlier comments about where Kenevin, he thinks, now fits with OODA or vice versa. Um, yeah. But everything that Kim was describing was in the observe box. And if we change the O back to S to sensing and all these different senses we have available to us, these are all the inputs that are helping us orient. Am I confusing what you were saying there, Kim? Or is that that sort of good, bad or otherwise? Uh, So it's it's everything, right? So learning to spin, right, is a whole different thing. So that's a different topic. But um, I was thinking it was closer to act. I'm acting, I'm doing a thing and I'm seeing what happens and I'm feeling what happens and what Ben was saying, I'm turning it into implicit guidance control. I think that's, you know, I'm I'm making myself into a part of a machine um, in a way, uh, which is a different topic again. But I I saw the act of spinning is is an act, right? And then I'm learning from doing that act. But uh, this comes back to a key point, Nigel. Human beings... It's an artificial construct to separate observation, orientation, decision, and action. Human beings don't separate. It's why we have to do all the work we have to do on constraint mapping to avoid situational assessment being based on determined action. You've got to start to ask the question and say, okay, UDA was really important at a period of time at the development of military strategy. But given what we now know, is it appropriate to see it as anything other than a historical artifact? And I'm now starting to see it as a useful historical artifact, but not as something which we can use in a current environment, given what we know. So I want to return to that 
in a minute. Um, sorry, who was jumping in there? Was that you, Ponch, or who? No. Uh, so, hey, David, I'm going to say that or my, my view on it now is I'm less of a strategic view of the OODA loop, less of a team view and more of an individual view. And the reason is because of things like Anil Seth's work on uh, perception as a controlled hallucination. And then the default mode network, uh, the way we could have multiple OODA loops in our brain and how uh, energy, uh, it takes more energy to keep the default mode network activated. And while it's activated, it's suppressing entropy in our brain, which doesn't allow us to connect novel ideas, right? So when you introduce meditation, um, well, yes, like yes, no, response, I think right? it, this is where neurodiversity becomes very interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, Chris made the point about how does he reduce the sensory stimulus? And that's because he's in the sort of autism end of the spectrum, right? Which is not negative, yeah. that's his life, right? Those of us who are dyslexic, so I can read a book in an hour and a half. Yeah, and pick up patterns because I, I, I can't, to, for me to read a book, page by page, line by line is bloody difficult. I don't do it that often, but I'm very fast at picking up patterns because I'm dyslexic, right? So one of the things, and, and this is the argument, is that neurodiversity evolved in humans, yeah, effectively to allow the tribe or the clan to have different sensory mechanisms available for different contexts. And you can relate that as the old adage in military, you know, it takes three years of war for the peacetime generals to die out. Yeah, um, yeah. If you if you go back to the Second World War, I mean, Patton is a wartime general. Yeah, and Bradley had the sense to pull him out fast when peace came because he'd have created another war. I mean, that's Bradley's great contribution to world peace. Right. So that that concept of contextual diversity in human intelligence and sensing is key, and it's where I mean, Nora and I didn't get onto this last night, but we both wanted to talk about synesthesia. Because I, yeah, so so the, the but the point is that the human the human species is evolved through cognitive and bodily diversity, different ways of handling different energy gradients, but it's collective, it's not individual, and that's the other problem with enlightenment thinking is enlightenment force focuses on the individual decision maker, yeah, which is actually not how we evolved. So I'm going to jump. I'm going to go to Lou next, because Lou, you were sitting there real patiently. I know John's got his hand up now, and I know, Ron, you were going to make some comments, but I'm really keen to, to go to you, Lou, initially, because you live a lot of this stuff day to day. What's your thoughts and feedback on what you're hearing so far? I want to look at feedback loops, and I'm not convinced on the word that the type or the usefulness or the... Uh, or the style of feedback is the right terminology, but the feedback plays differently into depending on what Kinevin domain you're working in. So when Kim's talking about spinning yarn, right? Her feedback is, she's looking for uh, an expected feedback, right? And she's looking for, to, to try to like hone that in, right? My kids are of the uh, Lego building and Ikea for, furniture building stage right and we've all been there Lou it's a nightmare all right I'm still in the Lego building phase I'm okay with it now think about the the diagrams that come along with Ikea furniture and Legos right you put the piece together and you compare whether or not the outcome that you had is that which is is expected of you Right? It's more of a, of a confirmation or a comparative type feedback. And I think when we design like the manuals and the processes and, um, and, and our functions to match up appropriately, we get streamlined, streamlined uh, observation orientation of that feedback. Which is so. Let's take the Lego and the IKEA furniture. That's going to be different than a forest preserve trail map, right? A forest preserve trail map. My kids interact differently with that because it's no longer comparative, right? But the feedback is now where I am compared to somewhere else. They get to start adding in decisions on their own and exercising judgment of where they want to go down the trails, which is different than free exploration in my neighborhood in places they've never been. So now they don't even have a map to compare to. 
And I think the type of feedback that my kids are experiencing and rattling around in their heads, right, is somewhat guided by um, the available tools and resources that they have, right? Whether it's the, the Lego directions, whether it's a forest preserve trail map, or whether it's nothing and just in free exploration. So are the resources that we give our people appropriate for those contexts, for those different domains? Um, one's very comparative, one's more, uh, where am I? And uh, the other one is, yeah, I don't know. I need to find some patterns in my neighborhood, find a common street sign. Um, so that's something that, that I'm working through now and the energy levels that go, go along with working through those different challenges. Those are three completely different challenges and, and, and they require different amounts of energy. John, let's bring you in because you had your hand up and then we'll see what Ron's thoughts might be on some of this and anybody else for that matter. But John, you had your hand up. I muted a few people because of feedback, but there we go, yeah. John. No, I, well, it originates with Kim's uh, response, but also it connects with Lou's. Um, so there's that learning process. So when you look at the OODA loop, part of it involves learning, right? <clears throat> so then the question is, well, is the OODA loop really a, a single loop or a double loop model? Because I would argue it's not triple loop. And then this, the second, the double loop is more when you add values and expectations expectations built into the model. So that's kind of what Lou was talking about. You can design the OODA loop and your training materials or whatever with values and expect expectancies in the loop when, for your training. So that could make it more of a double loop model. But so I guess the question is, where do you see it as a single or a double loop learning model? Who's the question to, or is it just an open question? Yeah, just more. I'll try something there. I think most of us, from a complexity perspective, are, re are rejecting the concept of single and double loop learning. Okay, but with all the feedback loops, that's why you're looking at some of the learning. It's basically, models. saying it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a it's a cybernetics model of the human brain, mm -hmm. not a biological model of the human brain. Right. Anytime that somebody brings up double loop, I said, well, what about triple loop? And then they say, well, what about quadruple? I said, well, what about- okay. they've, got, they've got bloody triple and, and, and loop I mean, now as well, Blue, yeah. I mean, it's, it, to me, it's, it's infinite looping and, and it's, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah. Well, just different levels. Seven, so seven loop loop is triple loop is more, loop. it's meta learning, learning about learning, but, right? But now, but there's a lot of things, John. I mean, double, sing, uh, Argyris' work on single and double loop learning is one. Uh, Young's work on conscious and subconscious or another. These are all things which at the time were hugely in, insightful and innovative, right. but we've now moved on. So actually we need to throw them out. Yeah, because you know science progresses by learning out where it was wrong, right? And we know there isn't such a thing as a conscious and a subconscious. And we know that the human brain and body don't learn on single and double loop. So that might be how you, how you actually write a computer program. So, I mean, th this is where we're moving into this materialist ontology now in terms of understanding systems. And Delander is actually a pioneer there. Yeah. I mean, so the other thing which comes back to something Lou said, and I, I think that was a really important contribution, Lou, is this is where we're now talking about agency, assemblage, and affordance. So decision-making is linked to the affordances offered by the environment provided by your training background the context that actually provides a counterfactual space and assemblages provide an entrainment space. All right. And the degree of agency you have is significant. So those three A's become really important in, in management. So I'm going to ask something because I started this whole conversation a while back with. I've been Dave. wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for. Yes, I you out that. there, Nigel. <laughs> So, so the joys of facilitating this madness. Um, so, but, you know, I remember Pomps has said before, and Ponch, if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong, because Dave just told me I'm wrong. But you said we start with acting. Uh, we, and no, you did not say that. But OK, so I got from today's conversation so far, I got the feeling that we act first. 
Um, and I sort of made the, the the sort of comparison that this sort of observed uh, area. Nigel, just, it's not a first, second or third. It's simultaneous. That's the bit I'm trying to get to. That's the discussion. That's the point. It's simultaneous. It's not a linear, linear step. Because everybody, I mean, we've got some points that I would discuss, but a lot of the conversation we've seen is focused on this Orient part. And, and indeed, with some of the conversations so far. But that's the bit I'm trying to understand because... Okay, but just to make a point, all right? One of the advantages of human beings is we can use processes to break the stages apart. And there's value in that. Okay. Right? So one of the things we can do socially is to separate assessment from action. But it's a very difficult thing to do. It's why we focus on constraint mapping, not situational assessment. So you have to move in directly. But the human norm is all of those things come together at a nanosecond level and they're non-linear in the way they interact. Yeah. That's the key statement. And I'm, I'm reading what Chris, you were saying about looking at the hol hol holistic nature or the holism or holism of Uda is important. And, and Lo, I'll come to you in just a second because most people who are listening to this and, and, and sort of more in the mere mortal phase like me is that we, we sort of think about something, we make a decision and then we do it. Now, that may happen very, very fast in what we pe people call instinctively. We know when you're in a, a very high pressure situation, I'm sure the police officers could easily talk about that type of thing as could Ponch and, and Ben with their military backgrounds, that you've got this sort of this need to act in what is an autonomous or instinctive way you don't have time to sit down and have a, an, a cup of tea and a long planning session you've just got to do it but most people think about it in that more linear fashion but what we're now saying is it's not linear it's parallel or all at once or random but with you know indistinctive separation between them is is that what we're saying i'm trying to simplify this for people like me it's non-linear highly interactive all right. And it's based on pattern triggering. So we, I mean, you know, the basic, we scan a limited amount of data that that triggers a synthesis of patterns, what Kornbuff called conceptual blending. And the first pattern we, we find, we apply. So that's kind yeah. of like a process, right? And therefore the whole OODA loop is, is basically complexly intertwined across those areas. Now, one of the things you can do with humans is you can break them apart. But if you allow human beings to do a situational assessment, they will assess it based on how they've already decided to act, which is why we focus, for example, on constraint mapping, all right, or now counterfactual mapping. So you focus on people on something which allows them to be more objective because the minute you focus on what we should do next, you can't trust any human decision making. That's a, that's a general rule, all right? Um, and it's why you have things like S2 Challenge and why you have red blue teaming. And those are post hoc corrective devices. And they're not as effective as other methods, but they are better than doing nothing. I think that last 60 seconds I will extract as, as transcript because I think that was a fascinating explanation. Lou, you were eager to get in during some of that. I had the pleasure to talk with recent police academy graduates yesterday, and we talked about Uda and Kenevan and all sorts of decision making aspects. And I asked them, I said, you ever seen the show Naked and Afraid, right? You basically go out into the wild with a partner, your pubic hair and like a pocket knife, and that's it. So what do they bring with them? Right? Because that to me is the orient. Right, that's what we should be dropping into the into the Orient box on, on Uda, and I wrote down what they put into that box: experiences, exposures, biases, patterns, thinking tools, frameworks, mental models, preferences and values, and intentions. Right, and that's what they end up bringing out into the wild, into the jungle with them. So, and those things end up changing, right? Minute to minute, day to day, week to week, when they're out in the wild. But what's any different than that in, in, in the urban environments that we're in? I, I really don't think it is. 
I always start when I talk about Uda in Orient in this fashion into what is it that you bring into the world right now? Because it, it, it's going to be changing, right? I'm coming into your life for these kids yesterday. They're, uh, they're mid twenties, men and women. And I haven't had them for the first 25 years of their life. So I'm jumping in. I'm starting like, what do you bring to the table right now? We're going to drop you off in, in, into, uh, into a uniform and a police car within the next couple of days. What are you bringing out with you? Because it, the most valuable things that you have are, is not anything on your uniform or that you're wearing on your gun belt. So I thought it was, it was really interesting that they brought in all, the, all these, these terms like experiences and exposures and the biases, preferences and, and intentions that they have with it. Um, that's what I wish Boyd would have swapped out uh, what he's currently got in there. It's interesting as well. I mean, I was walking at the weekend, all right? And it's now winter, all right? So I'm carrying the 33 liter rucksack, not the 18 liter rucksack because I need to be able to survive two nights, yeah, if, if I get stranded, yeah? Um, and I'm quite relaxed and comfortable. I've got micro spikes, which we put on for only 20 minutes, but we needed them because the pathway was nothing but three inches of ice. Um, I've got four levels of gloves just in case I lose one set, and I've just been walking all my life, so I know to do this, all right? And we meet some poor bloody sod from California who's you know, using his iPhone with a Google map, yeah, who hasn't got gloves, who's now four miles away from where he needs to be and thinks he can actually do what a three mile walk in an hour, all right? And he's gonna be walking back after two hours in dark. And I say, have you got a head torch? He said, no, I've got my iPhone. And I say, have you got a spare battery? He says, why will I need it, all right? So we ended up taking him off with us and driving him back to the starting point, all right? Now, the interesting thing is, the thing about human beings is we create social processes, training, artifacts, tools. And a lot of the argument is that tools are part of our extended consciousness as well, which actually give us resilience under conditions of uncertainty. It's what we do really well as a species, yeah? Um, we're homo faber as much as we're homo sapiens, right? Now, one of the points about the naked thing is if you take all of that away, somebody is in an almost impossible position. So you're going to drive a completely different set of processes out of them. Yeah, It's like the SAS did, because I mean, we're in the Bracken Beacons. There's the SAS monument on the trig point above, um, above the reservoir, right? To all the, all the guys who died in Afghanistan. Not, it's just off the beaten track. You have to know where it is. But that's where they push people to the limit so that they actually can't rely on what they've got. And they've got to find different ways of handling it, right? And I think that's one of the things we need to start to understand about human social systems. And the point I keep trying, I'm trying to make this point strategically. Military people spend two thirds of their time training for one third time execution. And we need that in strategy as well. Strategy should be spending one third of their time in simulation and exercise. Yeah, and they're just not doing it. And that's the only way you do it because you need to build resilience into the social interactions between people and things it's not something you can train without that activity. Ron, you've been 100%. nodding. And that's why military people are crap at, at strategy in general. Yeah, because they actually realize it's, it's, it's a complete waste of time, all right? Or, or it's got, what, what the fuck's the grand strategy? Okay, that's what we've got to tell the politicians. I mean, that's the other way it works, yeah? <laughs> so with pubic hair and bad language, I now have to put an R rating on this uh, session when I put it live, not for kids, you know. Ron, you've been nodding furiously with... You've obviously got kids. different kids from the ones I grew up with. <laughs> so, uh, Ron, <laughs> save us from ourselves. Another police captain with experience that might bring some focus as Dave continues to sip the uh, the adult berries a little early for that here um <laughs> I, I i really love so much of what dave's saying the you know the uh, the uh, distributed uh, network um uh pieces uh are, are spot on for what you know we have in in, in policing where we're we're relying on, uh, to a large degree, citizens to call in on their on the nine one one, or I'm not sure what the the uh, analog is for uh, Great Britain or nine nine nine. Would you nine 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 or Australia? I think there's a different one down there. 
but nonetheless, I mean, we're, we're relying on citizens to call in uh, and, and tell us what's what they see going on. We've got the dispatchers who are are taking those calls. They're sorting stuff out based on their experience and pushing things to the to to the forefront that sound uh, uh, you know, like they're really important, you know, like, oh, somebody hearing gunshots, things like that. Uh, you know, so they're pushing those to the forefront for the dispatchers to send us. But then also the officers in the field individually, Every one of them is a sensor, and uh, you know we're utilizing the radio networks and and telephone networks, video networks, all the other networks, chat, uh, text, you know, all those things, to be able to feed information. We're constantly feeding information in uh, to that system. Dispatchers make decisions uh, based on their training experience. A lot of times, you know, they may know something that the officers don't. Um, they're getting real-time information, or everybody, officers, the dispatchers are getting real-time information from the uh, computer systems that we have because we put the uh, calls into our call-taking system in a way that allows for uh, uh, these super queries to be fired off the moment that call is sent to a dispatcher. And so all the people, places, and things that have identifiers in there, our systems are searched for it, the address, things like that. So we can learn histories of places, people, and things that we're dealing with on a call or responding to on a call. You know, all of this combined with the experience of the individuals involved, the training, you know, all of that um, really come together in, in this beautiful fashion to, 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 to get us through successfully. But it's just spot on with what, da what Dave is, is talking about. And it's not anything that we intentionally set out to do. It's evolved over time. Uh, in a way that's very consistent, at least across the uh, the the folks that do the British policing model, it's 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 phenomenal how it's come about. Um, a lot of folks don't realize the you know the the, the intensity of it, the the beauty of it. But uh, nonetheless, um, I think Dave, so much of what Dave is saying is is spot the spot on 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 the uh, that piece, the loops. Uh, parts occurring simultaneously. I, I like a lot of what he says. I'm, I'm not so much uh, sure that it's archaic uh, uh, and, and, and historic. He may be right there, and I, I'm going to have to muse on that a, a little bit. But there is a point in time uh, on some of these things where uh, the collective knowledge of a situation or the people who are at least putting into it uh, runs out and you run into a novel situation that there is not an answer in the in the uh, in the experience database for and it seems like folks kind of slow down then and start through a little bit more of that uh, and, and I won't say it's linear uh, but kind of that OODA loop thinking where you're like okay what can I do here's what I've got I don't know what to do with it what do I want to try here and uh, that time kind of simultaneity kind of slows down. And Dave looks like he's got an answer for yeah, me. No, no, I, think, I think it's really interesting. I, I spent five years of my life in mountain rescue. Yeah? Right. And that was a profound training. Yeah? Yes. Including the first time I climbed up to the top of the Idwell slabs and the, the instructor pushed me backwards. Yeah, so I, I get to the top feeling good, and next minute this bastard's pushed me backwards, so I'm flailing in air, and then I knew the ropes caught, right? But I was thinking, I mean, the walk of the, the weekend I lasted with a really good friend who's in his 70s, and his wife who's in her 70s, and halfway around, we, you know, we realized she couldn't do it. And I flipped into support mode. Yeah, so literally at one stope, I was placing her feet for her. Yep. Yeah. And then and then I was thinking ahead, like five miles ahead on how can I minimize right. the route so we can get it down. Right. And it was only afterwards I realized all the planning I'd done mentally. Right. right. And it took me four and a half hours this weekend. It took me seven and a half hours that day. And I didn't notice the time. Right? right. And I think the human capacity to build intelligence into physical processes through training and experience is huge, yeah? 
And it Absolutely. seems to persist. I mean, I was on mountain rescue between the ages of 18 and 24, right? And I'm doing this at 65, 67, but I'm still falling back into that mode the minute it happens, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so, no, that, that's brilliant. Ben, you got your hand up. I'm going to bring you back in. And for those that are watching this video back later, the smiles that are going off, there's quite a lively chat going off behind the scenes in the chat box. If I see things that are relevant, I will pick up on them and throw them into the, the, the fray here. But Ben, I'll let you have some words, then we'll go to Andrew, because he's woken up eventually in Australia, so he's ready to talk to us. Um, <laughs> ben. So I always like, when we're talking about the OODA loop, to, to remember that Boyd, although he didn't write much down, he was quite prolific in what he studied. And one of my favorite pieces of his work is, is his smallest, which is destruction and creation. And there's a lot of things that we're talking about now that I think are much more, you know, strip away OODA and, and all of the labels that we put on it. But that mechanism of destruction and creation is, I think, what you generally get down to when you start digging into what's going on with with orientation so you know what what you were saying there dave about um the fact that you were able to re redraw upon all that experience even though it was a long time ago is because it was it it's kind of embedded in the same way with you know same with police work same with martial arts you've got all of that all of that stuff that's in orient is all a process of destruction and creation of breaking down mental models, building new ones. And um, I don't know, I, I, I think come back to this kind of idea of the representation of Uda as that diagram that Boyd drew. I think it does it, it does it a massive disservice, which is why I think the, you know, the discussions that we have here are important because we're, we're able to kind of hopefully see past some of that a little bit. So I'm going to, Ben, I, I'm seeing some stuff in the chat and I know that Charlie's put his hand up so he'll come in after Andrew because uh, Chris has posed the question, does this map to the decomposition, recomposition of complex systems to scale them? And that's an interesting thing because I had a conversation offline with Charlie and I'm sure he'll mention this later on when Boyd talked about his snowmobile example, which was very much along these lines. So we'll come back to that in just a moment if I forget. Andrew, let's bring you in, sir. It's nice to hear from you. Good morning, everyone. Um, look, I, this conversation's above my intellectual pay grade at times, so I'm, I'm just trying to bring it back to something that makes a little bit more sense to me. And the way I like to think of is how can I apply these concepts in the organisational construct? So I, I suppose where my head's at at the moment, I'll, I'll, I'll run this out and see what people think. But basically, an organisation is a collection of humans working in nested cycles. So we've got the teams working ideally in short horizons with tight OODA loops. Then you've got management that uh, basically sit above those teams with manageable horizons before you get up to the strategic cycle. And each of those loops nest. nest. So therefore, the strategic cycle at the top is that the timeframes are inexorably linked to the delivery cycles. The faster I can do the delivery cycles, the faster I can do the management cycles, the faster I can do the strategic cycles. The loops themselves have different shapes. So sometimes we can just decide and act, and sometimes we need to go through the whole loop. So the, the loops are longer for different contexts, and that carries right through the system. So from team to management to leadership, you've got uh, different shape loops that are happening. So I think Knefen therefore helps to make sense of things so that we use, we're at lower risk of using the wrong pathway through the loop. For example, relying on like a process or a procedure document to solve an emergent problem. The better the information flow uh, bi-directionally between leadership and customer facing teams and the more real time the record of observation, the lower the cognitive cost of orientation and decision making in the system, and and therefore, if I want to, if we want to kind of leverage this idea of Uda and Kinef and together, um, first and foremost, we want to work to reduce the timeframes of the nest loops in the organisation, and that starts at the delivery cycle time thing. So, if I think about the flow system and what what you speak about in there about 
improving flow at the team level that, that therefore cascades to the rest of the organization. We want to reduce the length of the cycle and the energy cost in the system through the automation of the things best suited to silicon systems and then in real time versus batched recording of observations to reduce the energy cost for humans and also making sure that we we're distributing that cognition out to the closest point to the information we want to train people in making sense of things and in decision making in understanding the cognitive biases that are in play and also the danger of retrospective coherence, which is the Kinefin context. And then also in, in, invest in strategic simulation. So focus on reducing options for competitors. And I think this is where the counterfactuals stuff comes in, but I'm not exactly sure. I'd, I'd probably have to spend a bit of time in that, but also increasing the energy of cost of options for competitors and that's that's kind of where i i'm at i'm sitting there was some fantastic stuff in there andrew and and i was watching the the flow of people commenting because the the concept of entanglement came up there uh, a lot while you were talking so i'm assuming that that's associated with some of the things John then sort of added a comment about the connection between the OODA loops at each level and saying, sort of just describing there needs to be a connector. Uh, so when we look at things like commander's intent or leader's intent acts as a connector, strategy goals could be others. Distributed cognitions also need to be formed through some form of mechanism. Before I bring Charlie in, is there any comments on what I just said and what Andrew was talking about? I think you need to switch from individuals to identities, um, some of which are roles, right? Um, because the reality is you haven't got a nested system, you've got an entangled fractal system. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's non-hierarchical, right? And I, th I think that that's a key issue on how we start to look at things like teams and crews to pick up on something somebody said there, right? Um, I think the other thing is, I mean, if, if you want to express intent, intent is best expressed in terms of abstraction, not the concrete. Because the whole point about commander's intent is if you knew what people should do, you could issue them orders. The whole point about commander's intent is you've got to communicate something which can't be communicated because you can't predict. And that's where metaphor-based command languages come in. And it's interesting, I mean, Nigel knows this, the stuff we're bringing in on the stuff we're doing on constructor theory, includes bringing back in the stuff I did in Quantico on metaphor-based command languages, because you have to handle high abstraction instruction. Yeah. Now, John, yeah. you wanted to add something to that, because I know you were in the thing, and I'm sorry, Charlie, I will come to you, I promise, so please don't lose your train of thought, but John, do you want to add something on that? Uh, I agree with looking at it from the perspective of identities, but there still needs to be some connector, or Ben pointed out, um, I forgot the term we use now. So some connect something to bring those identities. So you need a tractor. A tractor, yeah. <clears throat> so there's different terms. Literature is called connectors, but yeah, more appropriately would be the attractors. But how do you get the individual identities to be more shared identities among the teams, among the departments, among the managers? And that's the part that really needs to be focused yeah, when you're looking at larger systems. Uh, sorry, but an identity isn't a shared identity between individuals. Identity is something which individuals have aspects of. All right. Mm -hmm. So you take one of the most simple forms of identity is role. Right. Now, role can transfer between individuals very quickly based on different contexts. One of the ways that crews work is that actually a, a corporal, this is a strategic corporal, can actually have authority in some contexts that a brigadier doesn't have. So identity is not an aggregative concept yeah, in that sense. Yeah. Charlie, <laughs> how do you make sense of this? No pun intended. Uh, so I, so I, don't, um, I don't know how to follow up on all that. My, my, my hand raised because of some of the things that Ben was saying as far as uh, Boyd and Uda, and, and from what I've been able to discern is that the Uda loop came out came out 
fairly late or, or um, toward the end with Boyd. But the I I agree that the time and energy aspects aren't depicted in the OODA loop as such, but it certainly is within all of Boyd's briefings. And when you get into all the briefings, it really highlights, to me, there was a huge parallel between his briefings and uh, a lot of things that Dave talks about with complexity mm -hmm. and Kinevin. And um, the destruction and creation to me seemed very similar to what you had Dave with that shallow dive into chaos ah. where, where Boyd was saying you need to do, you just constantly need to do that because if you've come at your enemy with something once they've, they, they'll figure out how to react to it. So you've constantly got to be coming up with ways to hit them with something different, which then to me tied back to Ashby's law, which you talked about earlier. Um, so I think, I, I, so to me, recording this as a historical artifact, like I wouldn't be ready to go do that yet, but we are using, we're, we're, I'm using this, the OODA loop uh, in my trainings right now with change management. And along the ideas that that implicit guidance and control uh, from uh, orient to act really ties in with a lot of Gary, Gary Klein stuff to me on the rapid prime decision making. And um, going the other way from orient back to uh, observe ties into um, a book I read called The Unthinkable where basically people just froze during the Twin Towers incidents because they, there wasn't anybody telling them what to do. And that airlines have actually modified their trainings with the flight attendants to actually yell at people to break them out of that, that freezing and get them to go do things. Um, so I just feel like there's a, whole lot of, there's a whole lot of things that come with Boyd's work that aren't necessarily shown in the OODA loop, but for sure time, the timing and the energy gradient are there in all of his briefings. There's something very interesting as well. We, if you look at police firearm squads in the UK, because we have this quaint idea that police should only carry arms if they're well-trained and mature individuals, as opposed to just going around shooting people, right? Um, police firearm squads have very different cognitive processes. We've done a lot of work with them on stress and mental health, yeah, in terms of the way they make decisions because they understand the consequences of the decision. And I found something very similar with West Point. I mean, I, I love West Point. They're the brightest people I've ever taught in my life. And they genuinely worry about killing people because they're going to have to go and do it. I mean, I'm hugely impressed with West Point graduates, yeah which I never expected to be one of the two out there. And there was one connection I always wanted to make, and I was close to it, then Max died, between Brasso and Klein. So I think you can actually put Klein with Ashby, with, um, with Boyd, but with Brasso. And the key thing on Brasso is the concept of abstraction and codification for diffusion. Yeah. Now, the problem is, one of the things consultants do is they try and go high abstraction yeah, high codification far too quickly. Whereas actually, if you want real understanding, you want high abstraction, low codification. So in agile terms, for example, XP was high abstraction, low codification. Scrum was high abstraction, high codification. So therefore it diffused much more rapidly, right? And I think that's actually really interesting. So if you take the I space, and remember Max and I were the we were the ones who worked together with the US government on how the hell did we reverse Ashby? And that was bringing the ice space into account, right? So I think that those are different frameworks which we need to work. And I think where we are is to say, look, these are historical frameworks of varying degrees of currency, yeah? Some are up to date, some aren't up to date. None of them were devised at the time when we knew about the biology of decision-making in the way that we now know about it. So kind of like we need to respect, update, and revise, and create new frameworks. Yeah, um, and I think that that's why I'm less interested than I was in Kinevin Uda connection, because I think Uda was a huge contribution to development of the theory, but now it's not an appropriate framing. Yeah, 
although a lot of the things Boyd said are still appropriate. Yeah. I think, I mean, I've been writing some notes down before we eventually conclude this in the next half an hour or so, and, and that's probably one of the, the aspects we'll probably either agree on or have informed consent or disagree on one or the other. Um, uh, Charlie, did you want to add any more to that? I know you were in that train of thought. Was there any sort of additional feedback on what Dave's just been saying around that? No, no, I, I, I understand. I, I, um, I, I, I guess it would have to see what comes, what would emerge out of all this, as far as uh, uh, what what framework would entail after that. But um, I know just from a practical standpoint, we've been using it, um, like I said, from the change management aspect, and that what we found is that. Um, when it comes to problem solving and some of this um, overarched with some of the things that that Boyd uh, that we saw in Quantico in the archives. But I think one of the, the reasons he liked the Toyota production system was to me, Toyota actually had built into their system um, a, a way to keep from going down implicit guidance and control path when you're doing problem solving. And that my experience just from tacit knowledge is that it seems like 90 to 95% of the time when it comes to problem solving, people just want to throw a solution at it, which to me is that implicit guidance and control path. Um, and the OODA loop gives me a way to really to explain that. Now, I don't have the research to back up the numbers, but just from my experience and that to get and, and I but I think it ties in with the fact that it's such a low energy gradient to go down that path. And that when you do go down that path, um, you can be right or wrong. So from an implicit guidance and control standpoint, if there's a fire, what do we do? We throw water at it. Everybody knows that, that's our experience. But if it turns out that it's a chemical fire, now I've thrown water on it and I've made it worse. And, and in my world, that's what happens is people just go throw a solution at something uh, which has three outcomes. It makes it worse, makes it better, or it stays the same, but typically it makes it worse. Um, and that's where all the firefighting seems to come from because we don't solve the, the underlying problems. And to go down the PDCA path, um, which Chet Richards referred to in his book, that, that middle path where it forces you down through uh, Orient to decide to act um, is a higher energy gradient. And to me, that's one of the reasons we struggle with getting people to do A3 type problem solving in organizations. And then um, the other thing that we were kicking around was when you're from a change management standpoint, when you look at the Orient block, if you take the, the uh, past experience, the cultural traditions um, and the genetic heritage, to me, those become the filters which is referred to in the literature a lot, but it doesn't really break down what that is, but, but at least in Boyd's language in terms of the OODA loop. And that to me, you have to get through the filters um, before people are willing to even accept, you know, a new idea. And then once you get through the filters, then you can look at going down the rest of the path. So we actually drew the Orient block a little bit differently um, or we've been playing around with that based on that, that hypothesis. And that then you, um, depending on what path you're in, um, whether you're in, when you're in, um, you know, clear or complicated or complex, you're going down different paths, um, it impacts that. But the idea is that you still got to get through those filters first, and then you get into the analysis and the synthesis piece. So Charlie, I bought, I bought up the diagrams you've been playing with because I thought, well, why not? Um, there are four di uh, three, four diagrams and Charlie was showing me these early and he's done some tweaking on them. Um, do you want to speak to these briefly, Charlie? Um, sure, except that my comments about subconscious and conscious seem to be wrong now. But um, <laughs> other than that, so, so basically in clear, for the most part, we're going down the implicit guidance and control. We call it IGC-1. Um, 
So you're going down that path. On the next one, well, if you have you want uh, to me second day on number two. In the complicated, this is the PDCA path that you would have, you know, with your experts. And the idea is that you still have to get through the filters first. Then um, you analyze, and Boyd would say synthesize, because if you analyze without synthesizing, you can end up having uh, lots of problems. Um, and then on the next one, in um, in the complex domain, we added probes uh, after the filters, and then based on the probes, it can take you to analysis and synthesis, or you know, to at some point to a hypothesis. Um, and then the last one, I think I sent that to you. The chaos one, to me, was very similar to to the clear. But the idea is that you have to know that you have to know that you're in chaos. And to me, clear and chaos seem similar in that um, if 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 you violate the constraints in clear, it throws you into chaos. Ben, so you right. really brief. Well, no, I mean it's because the recording will allow people to play this back and then and sort of you know digest what you've said. Um, but uh, Ben, have you got thoughts on what Charlie's saying or something else? No, I'll, I'll take these slides off for now, but we can bring them back if they prove useful. Yeah, it, do, it does. Um, so the thought I have is, is I'm, I'm remembering a, a podcast episode that Bryce Hoffman did with uh, Gary Klein. And they were, they were talking through the likely kind of cognitive processes that were happening with... Um, uh, Captain Sullenberger as he crashed into the Potomac or landed on the Potomac. I'm not sure what the uh, correct term is. Perhaps uh, Ponch can tell me. Um, and and there was this mix of, so, you know, very quickly had to come up with a solution in very limited time, huge, huge stress. And picked, picked a, I think picked a solution first and then had to discount it. So there was, there was this kind of, going the low energy pathway and picking a what looked like an acceptable solution and i think that's what lots of people do and i think the the, the genius of sully and people that operate at a high level is that they're also constantly environment scanning for yeah. violations or looking for mismatches remember sully was a glider. Um, yes that's it uh, that's the most important thing sully was a glider pilot yeah, and that's how he'd managed it. It wasn't that it, it was that entrained pattern of, of flying gliders, which, and there's quite a few cases of engine failure where glider pilots have survived, whereas non glider pilots haven't. And again, that comes back to this building patterns, physical patterns into the body about decision making. Yeah. And if I was being slightly controversial, I'd actually say the whole of UDA is now what we call apparatic in Kinevin. I, Charlie mooted to me earlier on that Dave was saying this. <laughs> Dave's just now said it out loud. So let me just, I want to posit something because I've heard the term environment scanning, rapid scanning of the environment, environment scanning. Dave said it, Ben, you just said it as well. Um, am I dim or is that not observing? Is that not the first step before anything else? Because you filter, it, you filter it, Nigel, you filter it so badly based on what you expect to do to make a decision. OK, you're, you're, you're scanning two to three percent of the available data. Max. Chinese, it doubles. And, and that, that actually, I mean, I was doing this at Rhode Island, all right? Um, Chinese decision making is radically different from American decision making because they're context, not object focused. Yeah, Which, and, and, that's, and, and people just don't get and it. it, it, it it's, it's a whole different way of thinking about the world. Which is where we come back to the fact that everybody's focused heavily in this conversation and in other conversations on the Orient part, 
and, and Ben, you just wrote in the, the chat orientation shapes observation. And, and that's, that's a really important point is that, you know, we, the, what you're just describing Dave, but we still got these inputs, these signals coming in, but also the orientation based upon all the things that Boyd wrote in his Orient box, our cultural traditions, our genetic, genetic heritage, our learned experiences and things also shape what we see or what we sense probably is a better way to, to say yeah, that. That's, that's cognitive activation, Nigel. So the reason you put all his effort into fighter pilot fighter pilot training is so the three percent of what they see is relevant to the task they're going to perform and that takes a hell of a lot of training yeah and it, it doesn't work otherwise so just keep coming back to that the most you can observe is three to five percent of the available data yeah at that point any linear framework breaks agreed okay so I, i'm going to uh take us in a slightly different direction because when we talk about scanning the available environment with that small amount of uh, ability to see or to sense um i was having a conversation and this pivots a little bit on your conversation in the last thing i saw you in dave which was about different types of reasoning deductive inductive and abductive reasoning now i'm going to give you shit i can just see where this is going now dave sits back in that smug Come on, bring it on, look. So but I'm going to give you an example I gave Charlie earlier, which we thought was great, which you'll completely decimate. And my conclusion on this paper at the end of this two hours will be... I might take that 90%, not 10%, Nigel. Remember the meaning of decimate. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I have an old car, Morris Minor, for the Brits and the Australians. They'll know exactly Yay. what that is. So, and it's, it's the Woody. It's the traveller version, Yeah. So the other week I was driving a few weeks ago and the fuel gauge stopped working along with the oil the low oil pressure or warning light. And bizarrely, the wiper motor, the windshield or windscreen wiper motor stopped working all at the same time. And so I scratched my head and I, I mean, I have a background in electronics. It's my, my trade, electrical engineering electronics. And so I ended up, long story short, taking all the dashboard to pieces, which is a real pain in the ass in a, in a 1960s car. And when I'd first got this seven or eight years ago, it kept popping a fuse and the guy had looked at it at the time, popped off a wire and said, I, I disconnected this wire and it stopped it popping the fuse and everything worked fine until this point in time. So I had some facts so I could sort of get, start to deduce what was wrong. Yeah. OK, I had some known data points, but the changing the fuse and fiddling around with the fuse holder and some basic stuff didn't work. So then I started doing a lot of observation okay i started observing what was happening and examining and tracing leads and wires and i was doing some testing with test meters so lots of fact gathering and lots of observation and between that i was sort of gathering some hypothesis but anyway at the end of the day after two days of faffing around with this thing i gave up because i just couldn't get to the to, to, couldn't solve the problem i tried everything trust me i mean and the there's no way that the wiper motor which draws about 10 amps of of current had anything to do with the fuel gauge or the oil pressure warning light, which are all independent circuits. And then I sat down the evening after I'd had a couple of weeks of messing with this thing, and I decided in my head to come up with this gut feel, this sort of, you know, this, this hypothesis based on nothing other than my gut feel, my hunch that the car was wired wrongly when it was restored previously. And I took this sort of abductive reasoning, which is I'm hoping I'm using all the right terminology now, Dave's going to really embarrass me. And I went back to the car and I started by disconnecting everything, getting the wiring diagrams out and looking at the wiring diagrams and proved that it was right wired wrongly. Took all the wiper motor switch out, rewired it. And then I found three cables that have been added in, which had no purpose being added in, pulled them out, rewired everything as it was. Bingo, everything worked, bish, bash, bosh. And my further gut feel or, or my abductive hypothesis is the fuel gauge, which I'm waiting for replacement, failed because the other items were making a circuit through the fuel gauge. And when that failed, it took those, those other things out. And I'll prove that when the second hand fuel gauge arrives from the UK into Texas for me to fix it. So what I was trying to do is use that as an illustration of how we use different reasoning, different hypothesis, to a deductive, inductive, abductive, based on whether we have facts, what we're performing observations, 
or whether or not we're just having that gut feel, that hunch without none of the aforementioned. I started then to think was do, does all, and this is where I will get really slaughtered, does all uh, uh, sort of uh, observation, or does everything begin with observation, which is induction? which because, you know, Bacon 1620 it stood the test of time for a while. Is this where we start? Do we always start in inductive reasoning? Or, because for me to have a hunch, I had to have something to base the hunch on because I'd been doing something, you know, whether I was observing, deducing, looking at wiring diagrams, faffing around, taking, you know, doing tests and things. For me to get a hunch, I had to have some input to have a hunch. I just didn't have a random hunch about the wiring on my old car until the wiring on the old car had a problem. I'm going to throw that out there because this has a lot of bearing on the way that we think about complexity thinking around Kinevin, around the different domains of Kinevin, and how we actually form hypotheses to be tested. So how's, what, make of that what you will with my rambling about how I think all that works. I think if you, if you look at human beings, we evolve for abductive reasoning, not inductive. Yeah, we can be trained to think inductively. So for example, um, I get hugely frustrated at home because people don't do a limit. If they say something isn't working and you say, well, have you unplugged it? Have you plugged it into a different socket? Have you? So you, yeah, there, there's basic procedures you should go through to eliminate possibilities. So you narrow it down, right? So you can be trained to do that, but the human, the human ability is to actually see a pattern and respond. The downside is we're very prone to conspiracy theories. Yeah. The upside is we see radically novel connections. So abduction is natural. And I think the thing we're interested in at the moment is how do you manage abductive insight so that it doesn't become subject to conspiracy theory? Yeah. And that's the peace and conflict stuff I'm having major rows within the US about at the moment, because I've got a whole bunch of Democratic Party, you know, fixers who are just all about information provision and key messaging and narrative. And they haven't understood they're dealing with something far more visceral. Yeah, I mean, the, the Georgia Democrats are supporting me completely in what we're trying to do. Because they're basically saying everything worked when we got on the ground and we talked with people and we created empathy. So for me, the link between empathy and abduction is really important in human systems. And that's what Nora and I were talking about last night as well in the context of intimacy. Yeah. Um, and that's where human beings are at their best. They're at their worst when they, when they, dis when they, dis they, they increase the mediation levels and they move to inductive. All right. And the problem with inductive, and this is the, the classic case, the minute you can move inductive, given the data volumes most people have to make decisions on, and this is my physicist prejudice speaking now, they end up at the center of a normal distribution. Yeah, And that's where induction comes from, and that's where all the problems arise, because the reality of life is in the tales of Pareto distributions. And that's where you need abductive thinking, but that's where you need multiple sensors and you need disengaged sensors so you can trust the results which come out of it. So I will just for the benefit of people watching this after the recording, I will put a link to the conversation we've kept referencing with Dave and Norma at Nora Bateson uh, about abductive reasoning and lots of other fascinating things. There'll be a link in the description to this video. Ben, you mentioned that, you know, in the chat, I want to suggest that you started with action, Nigel, and then you only started reasoning when your action didn't work. But the first thing that happened, I re realized that the fuel gauge wasn't working. I observed that. And then by chance, I was checking other electrical systems because that made me then act. I observed, then I acted by try trying different things, realized the wiper motor wasn't working. When I turned the ignition off and back on, I realized the little oil pressure light wasn't working. And then after that, I started to do the other. So I did act, but first I observed and I still keep coming back. I know it's frustrating the hell out of probably Dave, but I keep coming back to this fact that the first thing we do is sense something before anything else. Yeah, but the, fil the filter is part of the sensing. That's the point. Okay. You're that. not sensing independently of the filtering mechanisms. Now I get it. Yeah. 
and and you were operating the car as well right so you were part of the system that started you've behaving also, in a way that you didn't expect you've also got the problem of a really sad individual who doesn't realize the point about a car is that you get into it and it takes you somewhere and it's not designed to be constantly maintained when it's 100 years out of date but yeah you know, that, that, you know that, that's a sort of separate process we need to overlay on this yeah you tell me I should send my Morris Minor and put it in a crusher because it's 60 years old. My view of cars are very simple. I, I lease them and I change them every three years. I don't expect them to go wrong. Yeah, opening the hood is something I only do under conditions of extreme stress if the car tells me I have to do something in order to give it liquids, all right? I mean, I, I, I think you're misunderstanding the nature of cars, Nigel, all right? Yeah, thank you, Dave. Ponch, you've took yourself off mute. Come on, lad, you haven't said anything for a while and you've lived this for years and I know you're passionate. What's what's your thoughts? Uh, I don't agree with uh, Charlie's uh, view. And the reason for that is the, actually, I'm gonna double down on what we put in the book. And the reason for that are some of the things that I'm learning about entropic brain theory, FEP, uh, which, uh, Ben, Ben's pointed out earlier, and then um, some things about the conscious mind and things like that. Another thing is entropy plays a lot into this. This goes back to what uh, Ben was pointing out about destruction and creation, and I think Charlie brought it up as well. If you remember the evolution of the evo uh, of the OODA loop, it was really in the 70s when Boyd had two failures. One, that, one is the F-16, F-17 fly-off, right? His EM theory said that the F-17 should outperform the F-16. This is where we get the fast transients and all that. So he is, his physics background his, his mind was challenged by an open system, if you will. And that open system was challenged again in, in Vietnam when our, our Navy top gun school challenged him and said, look, you're forget, forgetting about one important aspect and that's the human in the cockpit. Uh, and, and Boyd stood its ground and said, no, an F4 should never fight a MiG. It, it should never win, should never defeat a MiG in, in, in the air. The Navy proved him wrong, right? So I think what happened is that evolution went into destruction and creation, but he took with him something that Dave pointed out is very important. And that has to be with the second law. And that is you can't really apply the second law to an open system. Boyd mm. knew that. Yeah. He, he made it very, very clear. Very, very clear. And this connects back into what we're doing with psychedelics and um, uh, consciousness now. And I'm seeing this at another level. And when you look at the 3D diagram of the, of the, the Kinevin framework, the energy versus entropy, it's the same conversation that people are having about default mode network in the brain. You have this default mode that's suppressing the entropy in the rest of your system. So if you're going through the decision side phase of the OODA loop, you're increasing entropy, right? Because you're getting that divergent thinking to happen. And this is very consistent with what, what we're seeing in uh, other, in, in modern sciences with psychedelics. And it, it's fascinating what's going on there. So Boyd was really, really advanced in what he was doing. Um, I can't comprehend everything he threw out there. Uh, it came up that David Deutsch's name was actually in if you look it up, uh, he's referenced in one of the books by um, uh, Science, Strategy, and Warfare. Uh, I can't think of his name, his name right now, who wrote that. But, you know, constructive theory, when you guys bring it up, I'm like, it's already baked in. I mean, Boyd was thinking about this years ago. And the connection back to information theory and grammatical man and all that other stuff, Boyd was reading this well, well, well before we even became aware of the Kinevin framework for, for guys like me, right? So when we have to teach this to the military, um, we are way behind the power curve because our, you know, our leaders haven't read any of the books that Boyd's read. And what they're getting is the pseudoscience that's out there, and we have to fight that. And that's why we get the single loop drawn all the time. And I think it's a fantastic opportunity to use the current OODA loop to help them understand how does trauma affect this, um, our, our mind? Our, you know, trauma actually connects to several things inside the OODA loop right now, genetic heritage, previous experience in our culture, right? And Boyd actually wrote about this in, I can't remember, it may have been in, um, I, I forgot which brief it's in, but he writes about, we, we our psychological skills are, are gained through genetic heritage, culture, our exposure to the environment and previous experience. So there's a strong connection there. And I have to apologize because a while ago, I think John and I were going back and forth and I said, John, this doesn't apply at the, at the individual level. I was wrong, man. I think this really does apply at the individual level because of the evolution that Boyd went through, he, he, he realized what a lot of us realized that you can't apply uh, closed system approaches to open systems, right? And that was in the early 70s. And they, he followed the scientific zeitgeist at the time to get to where he is right now. But he never captured anything in a book because otherwise we sit back and just say that was wrong, that was wrong, that was wrong, which I, I think most point. of us would point out there. 
that's the point I was making earlier. Boyd's lectures are far more valuable than Boyd's writing or Boyd's diagrams. Yeah. I think the diagram, all the OODA loop representations do not do justice to how Boyd talks about the subject. And I think Boyd didn't have the mechanisms we've now got to take his intuitions and translate them into frames. So you end up with the OODA loop as it currently is, which is a linear framing which doesn't do justice to ideas. So I think if we want to move on, take the ideas, but we need different framing. You know, I was gonna say, I mean, two things. I think Dave, you're right. And I think what yeah. would serve Boyd well is if we all eventually synthesize all those lectures and things and create something, something emerges from that. I think that would be fantastic. And I think we've all had some playing with ways to do that. Ponch, you mentioned about how does trauma affect decision-making. I think that's a critical uh, aspect that is something we will probably investigate in the book that we're working on and decision-making. That's something people will learn more about in the coming months. But I think that's a key, key aspect as well. And then some of the treatments you're talking about for people who've uh, suffered great trauma and PTSD and things, that how does that then help with decision making so I think there's some really cool aspects that are coming in um, I think we've been at this for almost our two hour time box so we've got 10 minutes left as far as my my iPhone tells me um, uh, and I know Ron you were agreeing with a lot of things that Ponch was saying as well and, and there's some fantastic comments I mean we could go for another two hours on this stuff um, but what I would like to do in the last 10 minutes is I'd like to just do a, a sort of a round robin, if that's the thing here, and I'll pick just to give me your thoughts. You've all experienced what I think have been the most fascinating series of conversations. We all saw some of us were involved in the earlier Kenevin with the Snowden and Friends conversations, which were mind blowing. If we weren't involved, we certainly watched them. We segued into the UDA stuff because of the combination of Kenevin and UDA that emerged out of Quantica and then punch put in the book with John and I to sort of talk about these things um, and my, my head still explodes even now we're sort of eight hours into conversations I mean we've invested a lot of time my head still explodes so I'd like to get some sort of final thoughts this will be the last in this series it's the end of 21 we're coming to the end of a lot of a challenging year for a lot of people so I think it's a fitting end to this series of conversations which has helped it people explore these different ideas. And I know people have watched this, have found it fascinating. Uh, and I'm sure they'll find this mind blowing. I'm gonna go back as John, I know will, and transcribe aspects of this conversation because <laughs> there's so many nuggets in this whole series, not just these last two hours. But listen, I'm gonna start at the, my top left with Ben and ask you for a few thoughts as your sort of last few thoughts on this series i'll probably end with dave i think that would be fitting um, but we'll start with you ben and see what your sort of just a few a minute or so of thoughts on on this series and where you think your head's at now yeah wow um i mean first of all it's been a privilege um to to share this time with with everyone and uh you know to share all these hours digging into this stuff um and you know, I think I think what we're talking about is increasingly important as you know my my field technology is driving societal change faster and faster and faster. So actually having a handle on the me mechanisms underlying that and under underlying the effects on society, I mean it, it couldn't be more important. So yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you everyone for, for the privilege of, of doing this and um yeah, it's been fantastic. Charlie, I know you've watched some of these things in the past and you've, you haven't you have been able to join us because of commitments with work and traveling and things. And I know you've done an immense amount of research behind the scenes and still continue to do that. And are fascinated by Boyd, his, his, his years of work and research and, and everything around what we've been descri describing. So a few last thoughts from you, sir. I think I would echo what Ben said as far as being included um, with this group. This was, as you know, usual, I took pages and pages of notes. Um, I think um, I'd be really interested. I, I, I think I agree totally with the, the last comment that there's so much in the briefings that didn't make it to the model. 
And I think it would be really interesting to explore some of that. And I think there are a lot of linkages there with, with Kinevin um, in, in, in Boyd's um, briefings. And uh, uh, that, that's, that's kind of where I'd like to see this headed. So I think it would be interesting to see where that goes. So you've just given me an idea for 2022 and I'll see how this flies with everybody else later. Uh, I think we should watch, read, examine Boyd's briefings in a series of discussions next year and see where they lead us. And we'll think of how we can facilitate that format. Um, Professor Turner, my colleague, partner in crime and member of the trio with Ponch. What's your thoughts on this? I know you've followed a lot of this in the background and of course you've done endless research and we are continuing to do research for the upcoming book with Dave. But John, what's your thoughts so far on where we're at? You may need to come off mute. Yeah, no, thanks. It's good to be associated with everyone on this group. Um, just some things I listed we need to expand to an integrated theory, you know, whether theory on decision-making. So if you see good loop as a decision-making model, then it'll be integrated theory. But some of the things that need to be included that I, I pulled from <clears throat> various literatures, we need to look at how goals and intention are mapped in the OODA loop, consciousness, developing shared cognitions. It needs to be a multi-level theory, a testable theory includes multi-agent systems or network systems, right? <clears throat> needs to be contrasted with other decision-making theories. Uh, we need to look at distributed cognition and collective decision-making and then organizational climate. So those are some of the things that I think need to be kind of encapsulated into that, that whole. Okay, a little bit of homework for us then. Well, I've, uh, I've made notes. Um, Chris, you've been along this journey, I think, from the beginning, and you've brought some fascinating perspectives. We've had lots of fun about martial arts and science fiction and, and lots of other craziness. So take yourself off mute and give us some final thoughts on this, where we're at now. Lots of, uh, lots of bits and pieces. Yeah, I've been, I'm sure everyone's quite happy that I've been quiet tonight because of my voice. So, uh, but, you know, just, just going to echo I, I think there's going to be a lot of Ben echoing going on here. Um, it, it's been a privilege, not not just to, to be a part of it, but because I've learned a lot and I've had some of my thinking affirmed and some of it really challenged. Um, one of the things I love about these is that other people ask the questions that I didn't know that I had, um, which I think is a really fascinating, fantastic way to learn collectively. Um, the, the high points for me have been kind of exploring how OOD loops, I guess, for, for humans as a creature that, that is both quite isolated and like societies, because we're very old, um, works kind of with these harmonics that we talked about, um, socially, professionally, and so on. Um, and obviously where it links into all the stuff that I like about Kinevin and collective decision-making and the kind of patterns and interactions. And, you know, you just to upset Dave one more time tonight, you... Uh, I'm sure someone else will have a go as well, but you know the the kind of more holistic aspects, i.e., being able to see all of the small parts of this, but understanding that you have to be able to see it all as well, and, and the fact that it's all quite entangled. So, and, and lastly, I'm I'm fascinated by a lot of the work that the punch has been doing, which which kind of segues into a lot of this, or the other way around, um, to do with with traumas and different neurologies and and the way that we interpret a lot of these things. So. To me, this has felt kind of like the beginnings of the shape of a key that's going to help unlock more understanding, probably, as Dave says, by actually creating a different new framework rather than trying to build, standing on the shoulders of giants rather than trying to reconstruct a, a new giant from the old kind of thing. Um, you know, so, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed this and hopefully I've added some value somewhere. But uh, oh, thank you yeah. very much for having me. Most definitely have added value. Kim, let's cross to Australia. And I mean, you've been involved again from the beginning in this, and it's been absolutely a pleasure to have you and to listen to you and to learn from you. And in, in the conversations, you've had some fasc fascinating perspectives. What are your final thoughts as we draw this series to a close? Thanks, Nigel. It's been good to be a part of this. And 
uh, two kind of similar thoughts. I Once I uh, learned about the Kinevin framework, I made it my mission to help people understand that complexity exists and that it needs different approaches. So the thing about uh, models like UDA, frameworks, etc., they can be seen as very simple and simplistic. And reality isn't that. Reality is analog and entangled. And also, even the most simplistic representations of Uber, UDA have got value because they've highlighted, and I put it in the chat before, they've highlighted the importance of feedback. And by extrapolation, therefore, the importance of having sensor networks. So regardless of the current utility of the most simplistic things, it does help that conversation. We do need to have feedback. We do need to have great sensor networks in order to be able to see that complexity exists and manage ourselves in it. So thank you. No, thank you, Kim. That was a wonderful uh, set of uh, uh, final thoughts. Staying in Australia, Blaney, what are you gonna what are you gonna add to what Kim put in there? You two are close collaborators. What what are your thoughts? Because you like me, we're probably at the the beginning end of this, not at the other end. I mean, I echo some of what you say. Shit, my brain hurts. Uh, what do you think, Andrew? Um, yeah, well, first of all, Chris, I think it's very odd that an author has lost their voice. Maybe a little bit more clickety clack and a bit a bit less yakety yak might might help you get your books published. Um, but yeah, I think where am I going? The, to echo what Kim was saying, I think there's beauty in simplicity, and I think these conversations have a tendency to stretch. And um, I'm, I'm certainly I've got a lot of reading to do after this to catch up on a few things. But I think if we can start to draw it back to something that's simple, um, I think, Dave, when when you spoke about Kenef and the first time I met you, it was how can I describe something that you can just scribble on a napkin and have a conversation about in a, in a cafe? To me, we've, we've stretched things out a bit. Um, we've stretched the slinky out. Now, it, it'd be nice to bring it back to something a little bit more simplistic that's a little bit easier to, um, to, to describe. I think I would agree with you there, Andrews, that I, at my, I don't know if it's a skill or superpower, I think I've lost all of those in front of Dave tonight, but I, I like to be able to sort of synthesize this in a way that I can explain to people who don't really want to learn all the other things that we seem obsessed about learning. Um, let's go down to the police. They're both at the bottom of my screen. There's no reason other than where Zoom placed you. And I know Lou's had his uh, power. He had a power cut over in Chicago. Maybe the winter's biting there. Lou, let's have some comments from you before we get a Rob. Hey, what Andrew says about simplicity uh, rings with me. I think if that uh, we all got together to try to come up with some all-encompassing new framework, it would look as ugly as uh, some of these link analyses for crime in, in the background here, right? Like at, you get to a point where it becomes so so cluttered that it, it's too much and it loses usefulness. And I go to Farnham Street with Shane Parrish talking about a lattice work of models. And that's what I've been trying to do over the years is just collecting as many of these simple models, things that are... Uh, they all pass the napkin test and they're all wrong in some way, but they each have an application and they're gonna resonate differently with different audiences. For me, um, Kenevan and Uda have really resonated with me throughout the last uh, decade or so. And I find myself in a tendency of defending them a lot instead of finding out what their usefulness is and, and what their what their limitations are is I just find myself digging in my heels on them. And I think being a part of this group here has kind of caused me to, to, to look at some of the, the shortcomings of both of them, right? The shortcomings of trying to connect and map them to each other. And instead just kind of appreciate some of the, the, the simplicity in them and other models that I've seen. So uh, learning's at the edges. When you can connect two things, I think it's awesome. Uh, I've definitely made small connections on this but, but very powerful ones at that so thank you guys absolutely it's been an absolute stunning pleasure to have you along for this ride uh 
Ron, we'll talk to you, then we'll go to the serving reservist, and then uh, I'll head. Uh, I'll say a few words before I pass the the final words to Dave. Ron, what's what's your thoughts? Well, uh, having been uh, at Quantico and and starting into this conversation there, which is really was really a, a huge introduction uh, to it for me, especially connecting to Kenneth and uh, the amount of of growth and energy that have come from these conversations uh, is is phenomenal. I, I my brain has never been stretched so so far so fast, um, and I and I think the amount of learning it looks like everybody across the board has has changed at least some of their ideas about uh, about both these topics and certainly about the UDA. Uh, as as we've worked through that, and there's certainly a lot of growth opportunities for me, and I think for others that uh, they have mentioned as well, with all the different ideas and different references, um, the conversation has been amazing. And I think as much as it's improved folks' uh, uh, concepts around UDA, uh, it allows you to go out and make those bigger connections as well to individual uh, areas of, of, of interest, a super diverse uh, group of people, uh, uh, phenomenal discussions. And I really appreciate you organizing it and, uh, and uh, marshalling it along. Uh, you know, your work here, uh, Nigel, uh, should not be uh, disregarded. And in, the, in that regard, uh, it's, it's uh, made possible something uh, really special, I think, and, and uh, hopefully useful for the uh, for the rest of the folks uh, in the universe that get to see it. I think that's, uh, I, I appreciate the kind words there, Ron, and uh, maybe that will save me a little bit in Dave's view. Uh, Punch, final thoughts, sir? Hey, no, just glad to be here. Uh, a lot of things have changed over the last year uh, since we started doing this. The big thing for me is inside Defense Innovation Unit on the human performance side, we're, we're doing a lot of work and trying to understand what's going on with psychedelics which includes the uh, recovery, PTSD, TBI, uh, operator syndrome. It's, it's absolutely fascinating what's going on in that ecosystem, including wearables and things like that. One of my jobs right now is to create a brief for the DOD. Uh, where we're actually going to connect the OODA loop to trauma. It's very simple. Uh, orientation has a lot of things to connect to trauma already, um, including the concepts like the multiple hit hypotheses and what it does to your brain. And then psychedelics, getting into um, uh, what do they do? Increase in entropy. Um, you know, we, we get to get into some other types of uh, networks in the brain and, of course, get into counterfactual thought and learning about your previous experience from different perspectives. And it actually constructs something new in your brain, uh, which is pretty, uh, you know, neuroplasticity was put up there earlier. Pretty fascinating. So um, that's the type of stuff I'm doing right now. And that carried over into a movie, actually. And the movie's called No Fallen Heroes. No Fallen Heroes is going to follow some of my friends. I cannot be in it for obvious reasons. But um, I, uh, my friends who have trauma uh, from fighter aircraft, from being a fighter pilot, uh, they're going to go through um, some plant-based medicines outside of the country. Uh, we're going to follow them. And uh, we have some amazing things going on with that. And it's actually based on the OODA loop, too. So we'll be, we'll be using a lot of the language of the OODA loop to talk about our orientation, our previous experience, our genetic heritage, and things like that, how trauma is carried through our DNA uh, from our ancestors and how we inherit that and how to actually um, creates our perceptions of the world. And there's there's so much other, so many other things going on there, but uh, happy to be here. And then again, uh, the stuff we're doing our day-to-day -day work, it, it's really OODA loop, man. It's, it's fascinating to see a company adopt the flow system and, and just go nuts with it. Uh, we've got some amazing coaches doing some amazing work and uh, I'm kind of in the background doing my other stuff right now, which is really cool. So glad to be here. Uh, and uh, absolutely, Chris, we'll get together and talk about it. So, Poncha, if you send me some links, I'll make sure they're included in the description of this video uh, when it's released and later on that reference back to the work you're doing there, the book that was recently released, plus any of the movie work that's going to follow upon that, because I think people will find that fascinating as well. Um, I'll say some final words, just a couple of words before I hand back to Dave or hand over to Dave to give us final reflections since we talked about all this in his in his absence and then invited him at the last minute and go, what do you think? Um, and we only know what he thinks of me. So <laughs> but that's, anyway, when I set out to do these, we did the Snowden and Friends videos, which were just 
fascinating and brilliant. And I let me tell you, I still watch them myself, even though I was part of that com those conversations to learn some of the things that were discussed in those. They were fascinating. Of course, Andrew was there and, and, and some of our other friends and collaborators out in the world were there, some brilliant people like Sonia and Jabe and, and, and Matthew and others who wrote uh, the Team Topologies book. Um, but, you know, I, over the years working in my industry, predominantly in the lean industry before wandering into the hallowed halls of the agile world, which I'm wandering farther away from nowadays, I want, I crave to sort of watch videos of Drucker and Deming and Ono and Shingo, Shingo Senior, of course, and even people, great people like Akoff and stuff like that. There's a limited set. I mean, there's almost none from the Japanese folks and some of the, the other names I mentioned. And it, it made me want to start recording things because I don't know where any of us will be 10, 20, 30 years from now, which amongst our number will be counted in those sort of names that I use below. I can guess one of them especially will be in there. Somebody from Wales apparently will be in that sort of hallowed list of names. But I wanted to capture these conversations. So not only I and you guys, but also people watching this and people 10 years from now can look back on some of these just phenomenal conversations and see what we were thinking and whether we were right, wrong, indifferent, see what's evolved since then and have that, that wealth of knowledge to draw upon. And I will do more of them. We will talk about the Boyd lectures. I think that's a great way to go with this probably in this particular context. So that's really my, and, and when I say it's a privilege to be with you all, Ben, I know you said this to begin with, but you are all brilliant people. I mean, truly brilliant people with exceptional backgrounds and exceptional minds that are going way beyond the context of your normal day-to-day -day lives or day-to-day -day work to sort of improve what you're doing and improve the, the, the lot of everybody else that you touch and come into contact with in the different contexts you work. So I think that's amazing. That's what everybody should be doing. We should never stop learning, never stop experiencing things and never stop being told by Dave that you're wrong. Dave, final thoughts from you, sir. Um, two or three, really. First of all, I think Boyd had a complexity mind in the way he thought about problems but he was only just becoming aware of complexity towards the end. And I think his writing and his models got structured into a more systems dynamics type framing. And I think that's the problem, yeah. So I, I don't think the way Uda is represented really represents the depth of Boyd's thinking. Okay? I think overall, we're on the verge of something quite exciting at the moment, which is a very different way of thinking about decision-making. And it's not going to fit into the patterns of the past, past 20 or 30 years. But interestingly, it might pattern, it might fit into much earlier patterns, um, uh, particularly 19th century military strategy and things like that. And I, I'd make the general point that it you have to make things difficult before you can make them simple. Uh, this is a thing called premature convergence in complexity. It took a long time to make Kinevin simply enough people could adopt it and just use it. So we're at the moment in the stage of high concept, high, high abstraction, and we shouldn't jump to premature convergence yet. We can make it simple, but not quite yet, I don't think. I think that's a great way to wrap that conversation. And, and there will be, as I say, a book emerging in 2022, which I'm proud to say that Dave is working on with John and myself. I'm more observing. Um, <laughs> more of the conversations. Um, but listen, I'm just going to end the recording in just a second and then I'll say bye to you all afterwards. But for everybody who's watched this, this has been a, a mind numbing series of conversations. I hope everybody's found it valuable and knowledgeable. It continues to be valuable and a source of knowledge and inspiration going forward. And uh, look forward to the next crazy topic we decide to pursue. <laughs>